Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, and welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself. We're continuing our series of interviews with Eddie Conway. He's the author of the book, Martial Law, The Life and Times of a Baltimore Black Panther. He's an activist. He's been an organizer his whole life, and he's now a producer at The Real News Network. Thanks for joining us. Okay, thanks for having me. So that, that's my question. You, you, you're out of jail about six months, and you started working with The Real News Network. Why? Well, one of the things that happened uh, in the prison system itself was that uh, we got an avalanche of negative news about the community. It's always somebody being shot, somebody being killed. The, uh, the news were, was not only depressing, but it was uh, desensitizing. And uh, so a lot of people uh, uh, that were reading and studying and whatnot started watching like Russian TV or started watching like Al Jazeera or, or uh, the Chinese news to find out what was going on in America. The American, the multinational corporation in America that owns like 85%, six, six uh, corporations, own 85% of the news media here has a format that allows them to, to, to present black people and poor people in a negative light. Uh, and they also present uh, the elite in a positive uh, a light. So in prison, watching outside, looking in, uh, to see what was going on in America was what we did. And eventually, I stumbled across, came down to uh, do an interview with The Real News and uh, in the process, learn about the real news and the kind of work they were doing in terms of actually study, uh, telling the stories uh, about people in the community and people across the, the country in a, uh, in a real kind of way. And it was kind of like the first time I have actually uh, came in contact with a news media that was talking about what the problem really was in terms of the economics, in terms of the uh, need to organize on the ground, in terms of uh, understanding the history of the, uh, uh, the uh, environment movement and so on. And uh, so I volunteered uh, to work and do whatever I could because I, I seen that as a very positive entity and, uh, in America and it was needed. You know, uh, we had moved past the stage of Black Panther Party papers or political papers, uh, the whole paper thing was going. And today is like the electronic media. That's the way in which you reach a lot of people and you educate a lot of people. But also, uh, what impressed me is when I start talking about the real news, everywhere I go around the country, there's always people in the audience that says, I watch this, I watch that, you know. so. Uh, it, it, it actually represent a new uh, step forward in terms of us uh, uh, gaining our humanity and also in terms of us getting our stories out. And uh, I wanted to be a part of it, and so I hung around, and then eventually they said, well, okay, you know, you can get, you can work here and you can uh, help make this a reality for people across the uh, country. What do you think are the main challenges of the real news in Baltimore? Well, the main challenges in, in, in Baltimore for the real news at, at is, is actually reaching people and letting them know that it's an authentic voice. They, there's a, a, a high suspicions of all media in Baltimore because it's always negative coverage. You know, you turn on 45, it's just a horrible coverage of the black community. You turn on the 11 or 13 or 2, and it may not always be horrible coverage, but there's an absence thereof. You know, so I think the challenge here in Baltimore for the real news is to let people know and understand that this is a, a media that's in their interest, that's working to tell their stories. and. Uh, grudgingly, uh, little by little, they will come and get involved and engage. And uh, to the degree, and this is something I've discovered, any and every time somebody came in contact with The Real News, they became an avid supporter of The Real News. And once they go and look at it uh, uh, on, the, on the internet or look at it in Comcast, et cetera, 
uh, and then they start actually looking at the other stories, uh, it, it, it builds a support base, but there's still that uh, suspicion, there's still ideological differences uh, about what a uh, news media should be doing. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that this media is doing those things right now that other people envision that could happen in the future. Uh, so I think it's, it's, you know, it's a slow process, but winning the hearts and minds of the citizens here is a real possibility. We had a big town hall the other night. Um, what do you think was the significance of it, and what did you make of it? This is a town hall about, uh, we did a town hall on should the Baltimore community control the police. It was sort of a debate about a uh, civilian review board with real power. Well, I think that, you know, I mean, people have been crying out and people have been looking at the amount of violence that's been perpetrated on the community by uh, police and other uh, forces, whether security guards or whatnot. There's always been a outcry and there's always been what can we do about it. I think one of the things that town hall meeting did was it afforded people an opportunity to have that discussion about how do we make the servants of the people actually serve the people and not abuse the people. And uh, I think out of that discussion, uh, people uh, uh, left it with, with ties, uh, networking, and left it with a thirst to figure out what's the next stage. Uh, uh, in, in community centers and other places, it's always uh, kind of like top-down kind of uh, discussions about what we're doing and how we're doing it in your interest. And do you want, and this is something I've heard here all the time, I actually heard you say, do you want the hammer or do you want the flower? You know, and of course people are living in uh, dire situations and they are concerned about their welfare, safety of children and whatnot. So for the most part, if somebody's gonna come and save you or rescue you or protect you, uh, you're gonna go with that process. But what people, and I think this is what the town hall meeting did, with what people realize in the discussion in the town hall is a lot of times you call people in to help you and you end up losing the life of a loved one or end up losing the life of a, a, a family member because uh, the, the, the situation is uh, contained all too many times with the death of somebody, uh, whether they were uh, having a mental episode and so on, right? So I think the town hall meeting in and of itself is a good step forward and it needs to be followed up. Uh, this series of interviews was mostly uh, your personal story. And if you go back and start at the beginning, if you haven't watched them, you really should because it's a f sensational story. Um, so let's kind of end up on something personal. Uh, after 44 years in jail, one would think you were entitled to and might want to kind of take it easy. Um, you didn't stop. I mean, I don't think you were out a few days before you were organizing. And I know seeing you at, your real, at the Real News, it's, you don't just produce at the Real News. I mean, the, the day today you're going and doing a food handout, food handout program at one of the poorest housing projects in the city. You're working as a volunteer on a school where you're helping build a library. I mean, you don't stop for a second here. I mean, after 44 years, didn't you deserve a break? Uh, yeah, you deserve a break, but the, the reality is that you want to, you, everybody has a responsibility to try to make their community better. And one of the things that I found, even when I went in the prison, was there's an enormous amount of people that had an interest in improving the conditions in the prison system. And when I got out, I, I looked at the conditions and they were worse than, than when I went in. Uh, and then as I started talking to people, I realized that there's an enormous amount of people that want to change the conditions and uh, improve the conditions in the community. A lot of them don't know what to do or how to do it, but the, the desire to make changes is there, especially uh, among the younger generation now, 25 and under. I'm surprised and impressed. And just, just for uh, uh, one point, we put out a call less than a month ago for, uh, to get food to, to pass out, and there's so much food I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to get it all together to give it out. Uh, so, and that's just from 
people in the community, young and old and so on. Okay, we're gonna be starting a new show in the next few weeks called Baltimore Raw with Eddie Conway. What do you hope to accomplish with the show? Well, I, 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 my main objective is to start telling some of the stories in the community about things that affect the community, white community, black community, poor community, middle class, working community. I want to be able to show uh, what is going on in the community, that part of the news that you don't get from the other medias, and I want to be able to allow people to understand that it's not a hopeless situation and that they, the, the, the apathy is just something that's projected through the media. There's like pockets of resistance in thousands and thousands of areas in the city where people are doing things, but it, they're not getting publicized, it's not being reported, and so they, tend to feel a lot of times like they're just isolated. They're doing whatever they could do, but there's no real hope for us to, to change the com uh, community uh, and uh, to even take power in the community in a way that would be beneficial to the people on the ground as opposed to the, the elite. Okay, thanks for joining us. Okay, thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.